Good evening, a very warm welcome everybody in the UK, in the Republic of Ireland, in France, in Germany, and wherever you're watching our event tonight. My name is Hans-Georg Tungis. I'm the director of the Goethe Institute Glasgow. Antonio Guterres put it in a nutshell today. At the verge of the abyss, we cannot negotiate steps three and four, but only step one. If you hear the voices of tens of thousands of young people on the streets of Glasgow during COP26, it could sound more precisely, yesterday we were still on the brink, today we are one step further. Well, where we are exactly, we will probably find out after a presumable COP extension on Sunday or Monday. Before the COP started, some were announcing a turning point for humanity. Some demand a green transformation in our economy and society, whilst others see politics, science and technology as having a duty to drive change. In essence, it is about a fundamental cultural change. So it is all the more important that partner institutions and the cultural sphere join forces to create synergies. As you probably know, coinciding with the COP26, the Alliance Francaise de Glasgow and Dublin, the Institut Francais d'Ecosse, the Goethe Institutes in Dublin, Glasgow and London have joined forces to present tonight's panel discussion, co-hosted by the Climate Crisis Film Festival. This evening, we are talking about the access to water in the context of the climate crisis. Complementing the talk is the, outline, the online screening of the very engaging French movie Above Water, Marché sur l'eau, directed by Aïssa Maïga, which will be available to watch in the UK and the Republic of Ireland for 24 hours, starting tonight at 8 p.m. On Goethe On Demand. The film is free and the link will be available in tonight's chat window. Above Water deals with the topic of global water accessibility in times of climate change, climate justice and global warming. Now, I'm pleased to be able to announce to you this evening, our guests, Dr. Karen Helvig, Professor at Glasgow Caledonian University, Anne-Marie Melster, co-founder and director of Artport Project, Lamia Esemlali, she shepherd from Sea Shepherd France, and Anya Murray from IECOI, who will facilitate tonight's talk. Anya is an environmental policy analyst and ecologist. She has long been an environmental advocate and has been active in highlighting the importance of protecting our natural environment, wildlife and ecosystems. She has worked with Antashke, the National Trust for Ireland, as a natural environment officer on European and Irish environmental policy and as land use and habitats policy officer at Birdwatch Ireland. She is a member of the Irish Environmental Network and the Irish Wildlife Trust. She's also a regular presenter on the Irish national broadcaster RTE, RTE's environmental programs, ECOI, and Net Nature File. Now, my colleagues have asked me to make a more technical remark. If you could please your questions in the Q&A window at any time throughout the discussion, there will be time towards the end of the session, around 7.30, for the speakers to reply to them. Finally, before we start, I would like to thank all our speakers 
for taking the time to join the talk tonight. I'm looking forward to an exciting and stimulating conversation with you. And I'm now handing over the floor to Anya and wish you all a very pleasant talk. Thank you very much, Hans Georg. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, I am absolutely delighted to be helping to moderate, facilitate this event tonight with a really interesting, wonderful panel of speakers. Um, and I can also say I watched the film, the link will be provided in the chat, and I think it has also been emailed to everybody who's registered this evening. Um, but the film Marché sur l'eau, uh, Walking on Water, uh, is absolutely wonderful, really, really beautiful cinematography uh, and, and very pertinent in the issues that it raises and the community who we get to meet in watching the film. It's quite a, a, I thought, fly on the wall kind of, it, it doesn't give you a lot of context. Um, it's not campaigning, it's not an advocacy film, and yet it is in a very, very subtle way. Um, so it was a very powerful um, film, which certainly uh, influenced, I felt it influencing my values and my perspective. And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about in the discussion tonight. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing our, our panellists. Um, we have Dr. Karin Helvig, who is involved in research about pharmaceutical pollution in the aquatic environment. She's also currently involved in a research program uh, on micropollutants in Brazil. Uh, her work is wide ranging in that it incorporates catchment analysis, predictive approaches for risk assessment and environmental stewardship, including access to water in some of the projects that she works on in both Scotland and in Africa. Um, Karin is also the programme leader of the, the Masters of Science, the MSc in Climate Justice in the Glasgow Caledonian University. And some of the, the students who she's working with there come from a range of backgrounds. She had mentioned that some come from artistic backgrounds um, and many of the, the PhD students who she supervises are involved in a lot of really interesting projects. So uh, we're delighted to welcome Karen here with us this evening. We also have Anne-Marie Melster, who is an international curator and art critic. And Anne-Marie has made a name for herself in the field of art and climate change through the interdisciplinary art projects with Artport Making Waves. Um, she's collaborated with internationally renowned artists and institutions, including the UN and the IUCN. And hopefully she will tell us more about that as, as we go on here. Um, all about raising awareness of climate change through the medium of the arts, which is something that, that really is growing and we need to see more of. She's been quite a pioneer uh, at the interface of art and climate change. She's created art programs for various climate conferences, as well as for COP23 in Bonn. Um, and each of these programs involves entire cities, so not just one installation, um, with the target audience of, of the widest realm of civil society, as well as the delegates to those conferences. So we're delighted to welcome Anne-Marie Melster here. We also have uh, Lamia Esemlali, who has a background in environmental science and is the co-director of Sea Shepherd Global, an organization that I'm sure most of us have heard of. She uh, founded the French branch of Sea Shepherd in 2006, and she's been the president of that since 2008. Lamia has organized more than 30 on-site missions for Sea Shepherd. She's also an author, and a speaker, and she's an active contributor to the media in many matters concerning ecology, in particular ecology around the ocean today. Um, so thank you to everybody who is attending here today, and I'd like you all to, to welcome uh, Lamia, Anne-Marie, and Karen here this evening. Can you all put on your, your videos there, please, our three panelists? Wonderful. Thank you. Um, to start with, in terms of the, the, one of the, the main issues that's in the film that we all have the link to and which you'll be watching later on, Karen has done some work around access to water uh, and she's going to give us a few slides on that. She's going to give us a little five minute briefing about her work on access to water, which specifically relates to Scotland. 
Thank you, Anya, and for that great introduction. Um, OK, I'll share my screen now. Um, yeah, so um, I was camping here about a decade ago, and I think that was the first time I realized that um, water is not plentiful everywhere in Scotland. Um, so on this island, um, there is no mains water. Um, and when I was camping, I realized there were also no freshwater streams. So we had to pack our bags and uh, retreat to the Isle of Mull, which does have water. Um, then quite a lot, well, uh, about a decade later, the Scottish government asked us to look into um, private water supplies in Scotland. Um, about 4% of the population, so 180 people or so, are not connected to mains water. And um, they have to fend for themselves as far as water is concerned. So um, they have all sorts of weird and wonderful systems, including rainwater harvesting, um, boreholes sometimes, and most often just what we call a pipe in the burn. Um, so you see here on these images, uh, the blue plastic piping is a real telltale sign that you're looking at a drinking water supply. So the water is pumped from a small stream into a storage tank and then uh, discharged to the house as required. Um, the quality is relatively poor on these supplies, despite some basic treatment that's usually in place. Um, and these supplies are really quite vulnerable to climate change impacts. Um, of course, um, with increasing droughts, the um, supplies are likely to um, dry up more frequently. Um, and with increasing floods, um, contamination is likely to be more of an issue. So I've got a few more pictures on the next slide. Um, the lake on the right was where some people got their drinking water supply. Um, on the left, you see a very, very typical peat colored water supply. And also on the bottom left there, you see um, the burns are not protected in any way. You know, any grazing animals will just have access to them. Um, so I mentioned drought. The projection in Scotland is that um, droughts are going to be much more frequent with climate change. Over the next 20 years, that frequency is likely to go up, which used to be about once every 20 years, and it's going to be more like once every three years or so. And they'll also last longer for um, up to two to three months. At the same time, the rainfall is likely to get more intense, and that can lead to um, surface water, um, well, to surface flooding. Um, so how does that impact on the private supplies? Um, typically, as you saw on that first image, the storage tanks are quite small. Um, so when there is a drought, there is not enough um, recharging going on um, and people can find themselves without water. So everyone in those communities, um, or at least some people in every community that we went to, um, recalled having run out of water in the past. So that's a situation that we're likely to see more of. Um, and what happens very frequently as well, whenever there's heavy rainfall, debris, including fecal matter from grazing animals, washes into um, the water supplies and that leads to quality problems. Um, okay, sorry, that was too soon. Um, so, the, the, the overwhelming impression we got is that most people are fiercely independent. These are people in remote rural areas and island communities. Um, they look after themselves. They um, don't like government interference. And they often said to us, look, these are private supplies and we'd like to keep it that way. Um, but that also meant they were reluctant to ask for support. Um, and when there is no water, then being fiercely independent isn't necessarily enough. So what we really need here is um, bottom-up solutions. Um, people need to be involved in deciding you know, how this situation needs to be addressed um, because every community is different. Um, some communities are incredibly 
capable, lots of people that are prepared to put time, effort, um, and a lot of knowledge into um, the management maintenance of um, water supplies in their community. And in other communities, there just isn't that capacity because many people work in two jobs already and they just simply don't have the time. Um, I think that's probably enough as, as an introduction to um, the private water supply situation in Scotland. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, one of the things that, that you've mentioned is the, the situation of drought and there will be drought once in every three years and I know that in Ireland as well which uh, where I'm, I'm from and I'm based the reputation is that we are such a rainy country and we are a rainy country we're full of lakes and rivers and peatlands and other wetlands um, and yet th there are droughts occurring now in, in March and in April each year and there's massive ecological consequences to that that is such a big contrast to areas like in the film it's Niger is is featured and one of the comments that they made in the film was that um the the the, ray, the days that it rains rainy days are limited to two months of the year and it didn't used to be like that so they were saying that in in very recent times um, a decade ago it, it, they, they had a, a more dependable rainy season and the impacts there were absolutely massive. You can see areas that were, um, the vegetation was tall enough that a child would get lost, that there were giraffes, there was a number of different animals. And what we see in the film is a very arid landscape where those grasses um, only appear very briefly. Have you, you've also done some work, Karen, uh, in Africa. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the drought conditions and how they are changing and how that's impacting access to water for communities yeah um we've we've been involved in a number of projects um one is um where we've been interviewing uh rwandan smallholders so farmers with you know small plot of land um some of those are well most of those were associated in cooperatives and that's social structure well it's it's just, it, the cooperatives offer social financial and technical support uh, so the um, through the cooperatives um the farmers act uh, can rent uh, land from the government and that's often the most productive land where they grow their cash crops so that's a really important source of income for them but in addition to that they also have a smaller plot usually on the hillside uh, rwanda's quite a mountainous country and that's where they grow their subsistence crops so that's the food that they use to feed their family and to sell on the local markets so that is really really important for local food security and what you're seeing is that when there is a drought um, the crops that are growing in the in in the valleys which are the, the cash crops um, they are usually benefiting, well, not always, but at least often there is um, a benefit from maybe a dam or some irrigation infrastructure, but there's much less of that on the hillsides. And because it's a hillside, um, it's difficult to, you know, drill a borehole and, and get water that way as well. So when there is a drought, it's those subsistence crops that are most likely to be impacted. And it's not just a drought either, it's they also say, similar to in Scotland, um, when there is rain, it's much heavier and that damages the crops and it leads to soil erosion as well. So you see very, very direct impacts on food security, on health, um, on children's education as well, because people can't afford the school fees anymore. OK, that, that, that is, is one of the things that, that um, was featured in the film. Um, I wonder how do we know this? We have a lot of information on what the impacts currently of climate change are and how much worse they are set to get. Um, and yet we have, you know, the gap between the promises that world leaders are making um, in COP26 there in Glasgow, where some of you are this evening, and the, the action that we're seeing. And we know that the, there was also a lot of things agreed to in, in Paris, and there's a, a massive gap between the, the action. Um, and there are fundamental changes are needed in the way that we do things. And this has to come, it's, it's, the, it's when people are 
engaged with the issues and with the, the threat um, that they put the pressure on we need. Um, and Marie, you talked about creating bottom up engagement um, to get top down action. And that's, that's particularly relevant to the decisions that are being made at the moment um, in COP26. How do you see a way to, to get more engagement um, from the bottom up, Anne-Marie? Uh, hello, first of all, good evening. Um, yes, we have been, maybe I can present it in a little bit broader way because we started with iPod Making Waves already in 2005 um, because we saw that in the art there was not enough environmental um, activity so there was actually not a real focus of course you, you had artists who, who were working on environmental issues and uh, some curators as well some museums as well but overall the topic climate change was quite a novum at that time in the cultural world and when we started it it was quite um, challenging in the art world, but also in the UN world, because the UN world at that time didn't have really an understanding of what contemporary art and um, artistic engagement with the topic of climate change meant. Um, and we said it's important to have um, the arts in this discussion not only to push the policymakers, because it's important to have artistic programs everywhere where policymakers are meeting, but also to push society to think a little bit deeper. It was at the beginning, it was about sensitization, but very soon we realized that sensitization is not everything. And most of the people worldwide are sensitized now. So it's right now going really into action. So climate action, ocean action are really important topics. And um, so we need to move. Um, I'm sorry that I missed maybe part of your question because I was dealing with the camera issue. <laughs> <laughs> Just you've kind of answered it, but it's it's talking about the gap between the promises and the action that's being made at the, at the top level, the political leaders who are there in Glasgow at the moment, and the gap between the the action, yeah. and what they're promising and what they're acting, and and how we bridge that gap is by having more people, yes. more engaged, calling more strongly for that action. How yeah. do we do that? How do we get that wider engagement? Well, first of all, I would like to be very positive and optimistic. I always try to do that specifically in our context, but I have to say we are presenting projects and we are working together with policymakers and scientists and artists and uh, young people for climate change conferences since 2009. And we had the same movements going on in Copenhagen. Maybe we were more people now marching on the streets specifically on Saturday, then in Copenhagen on one night, uh, I think we were 80,000 uh, civil society representatives from all over the world marching through Copenhagen. So the movements were already there. In Paris, it was very strong. In Cancun, where I participated as well, um, you can imagine Cancun is a touristic city, so that was not very active there, but Paris was active, Bonn was active. Now we are here like um, six years after, after uh, COP21 in, in Paris and nothing has happened. So we have to keep on pushing. I have the impression that something is moving inside of COP26, but not enough. So we still need the overall um, civil society to push harder. And this means not only the already converted, because that's what I see here. A lot of people are preaching, but to the already converted. There are a lot of activists on the streets or inside of a conference or, well, uh, exhibition spaces where they are convening, but they are already converted. They are already convinced that climate change is serious. We have to get on board the other part of society, the ones who don't care, the ones who have a difficult life, who cannot focus on to reducing their carbon footprint. So it's for us, it's all about education. So educate and not only education of the young people, but also of the older people. Because when people hear the word education, they always think, oh yeah, the kids, but it's about really everybody. And that's what we keep on pushing. So we are perseverant. We started 16 years ago and we will continue. And I just had a fantastic and very successful week here at the Glasgow School of Art. We have been working with students here and it was amazing. And you see like a difference before the, between the before and the after. When I said goodbye to the, to the young people, to the 25 students today, they were overwhelmed, they were like inspired, they were stimulated, they want to work, they understood so much more. And this gives me goose pimples. So um, I'm empowered to work for the next 20 or 30 years, continue working on this. 
that is wonderful to hear and that that's I, I guess what what we're getting at here and what you are embodying in in your work um it's that the arts carries these messages in a completely different way that science and the scientists and, the, and even the policymakers and the campaigners do. The arts can frame the, our values, can impact our values very differently. Um, can you tell me the, a little bit about the experience of working with artists? I also have many of my community would be artists and many of them are not particularly engaged still, which I find um, surprising in, in climate change, in biodiversity loss, in, in, in water, those issues. That's true, but there are a lot who are working on this. And since 2005, I can tell you a lot more people, a lot more artists are working on this topic. And not only in a mere visual way, like creating beautiful artworks, but really engaged in an interdisciplinary way. They are almost becoming scientists. They are doing a lot of research. They are really going into deep. Um, of course, some of them, they are highly intellectual, like forensic oceanography, for example, from Goldsmith, uh, Goldsmith College in, in London. Um, and then you have others who are really like very, um, they are activists. And we had, for example, yesterday, we had um, um, a performance group from Oslo, from Norway, as our guests here at our hub at uh, GSA. And uh, it was one Joik singer, so he, he is Sami from northern Sweden. We had one philosopher, well, they are called being Salman, being human. Uh, one um, storyteller, Norwegian female storyteller, one German philosopher, but based in Oslo since a long time, and the Joik performer, the Joik, the Joik singer from northern Norway. And they performed um, around uh, the topic of, of uh, salmon because salmon are really important for indigenous people for the health of the rivers for the health of the ocean and they are symbolic and we were sit i have to admit i was sitting there i was crying i was so touched by the performance and by you know the, the message which came across so for me working with artists uh, of course i choose the artists i want to work with but some sometimes they just cross my way by coincidence it's just um it's mind blowing sometimes. Okay, sometimes it's difficult, but that's normal life. But sometimes it's, or most of the times it's really, it's opening new fields of knowledge and new fields of feelings as well and new fields of working because through them, I am so much more empowered and um, uh, my work is enhanced because I'm, I need the artist to, to transmit the idea which I want to transmit. So, and then this cross-disciplinary work with artists and scientists is just fantastic. When you have two experts from two different um, fields coming together and working together on something, and it doesn't matter what kind of artwork comes out, a film, a performance, a theater piece, photography, a book, uh, like a publication or a virtual map or a walk. We have been doing so many different uh, things. It's, it's really inspiring. I personally have just kind of come to this in, in a big way in the last six months by, by doing some collaborative project with a number of artists. Um, and I find it the most exciting frontier of, of winning over the hearts and minds that we need to do to make uh, environmental activism and action uh, so much more to the fore of our, our public discourse. Um, I also know that uh, the, the arts is certainly one way and really, really crucial. And there are other actions. Lamia, you are involved in, in Sea Shepherd, more than involved. Um, and you also, your actions and your missions very much capture the hearts and minds of people around the world. Um, can you tell me about your approach to how change happens, how to make change happen, how to increase people's understanding of the ocean in the role of climate um, and get people to tell governments that they want change so that that differential between the general population and how they see the issues and the actual legislation. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, what I uh, personally love about Tishabur and what attracted me in the first place when I met the captain for what time in 2005 in Paris, uh, so for what is the founder of Tishabur, is that um, I believe the way we do things can be really inspiring to people. Um, we put ourselves in the front line 
really, I mean, the first question that the captain Paul Watson asked me when I met him and when I heard his speech and I recognized myself in what he was saying regarding the ocean and the, the respect we must have for life, the first thing he asked me is whether I was ready to risk my life for a whale. So that's not a very common uh, question and commitment. And at that time, I have never seen a whale in my life. But to me, the, I mean, the answer was obvious. Um, and when I joined a few months later, um, and for my first campaign in Antarctica, I was actually in a position where I had to test that, uh, that answer, that determination. Tell us about that. So we were, uh, we're tracking down the Nishimaru, which is the factory ship, the factory whaling ship that is actually uh, getting the whales on board and, and cutting them into pieces and storing them in, in freezers. So basically, this was the key piece of the whaling fleet, and this was the ship that we were absolutely, that we absolutely wanted to find. Because if we find that ship and we stop the whales from being hauled uh, on, the, on the deck, then the, the harpoon uh, have no reason anymore to kill whales because if they don't process the whales, if they don't freeze it uh, uh, within the next uh, 48 hours after uh, uh, she has been killed, then the meat is not, uh, uh, is not usable. So this was the best that we had to find and it's an 8,000 tons vessel and we were on a ship that was 700 uh, tons vessel with far more so 10 times smaller. And I mean, looking for the Nishimaru in that huge area in Antarctica, the, the, hunting, uh, the hunting zone was like trying to find a, a needle in a, I don't know how you call that in English, but you know the Haystack, thing. yes, needle in a haystack. Right, thanks. So it, it, was, it was very, very difficult. And, and we almost miraculously found that vessel uh, the day after Christmas uh, on the winter of 2005. And it was a, there was a storm and a swell of eight meters. And uh, we basically placed ourselves in the way of that vessel uh, because Paul said we have to block that vessel. From, from going ahead. And the Nishimaru, I mean, the only thing that we could hear in the air was that we call the voice getting out from the speaker, the loudspeaker of the Nishimaru, telling us to get out of the way. And, and Paul said, well, we are not getting out of the way. We are staying there because there is a message that we want to put across. And because when we say that we are ready to risk our lives, we mean it. And if we back down now, then we may as well go back home. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, if the Nishimaru hits us at that point with that swell and with the fact that our ship is quite old, and it's 10 times smaller, basically it's gonna split our ship in two and uh, we have like a few seconds um, mm -hmm. of um, time in that freezing water. And we are in the middle of nowhere at the edge of the world with no rescue possible. And anyway, at that moment, when we get the message from the first officer who tells us, okay, collision in two minutes. So we are all wearing our survival suits. And basically I'm thinking, okay, well, this is the end. That's it. Collision in two minutes. We are all going to sink. We're all going to die here. And, and that's it. And, and what happened at that moment, I was very scared because I thought, okay, I'm, not, I'm never going to see my family ever again. And that's it, this is where it ends. But for me, it was a ultimate test, test because, because not one second, not for one second, I regretted being there or joining the ship. I knew I was exactly where I wanted to be. And, and that has been like, um, yeah, a, a revelation that I was really ready to risk my life for real. I don't want to die. We all, I mean, we all cherish life, but we all think it's worth it. It's worth it to take risks for something to really believe in. And of course, not everyone has to do that to put themselves in the front line to be engaged and to, and to be uh, uh, useful to the cause. But I think that having people doing it 
is inspiring also for people who who don't really care. You know, like you don't care for the ocean. You think that you you're not concerned, or you don't really care for whales or what ha what is happening out of sight and out of mind. And when you see people ready to to give so much and to risk their life for that, then I think it it it, it forces someone to wonder. Maybe this is important. Maybe this is worth it. And I think that's what Sea Shepherd does. It inspires people to, to do things in their own way. I mean, the, being on the ground, being in the ocean is not necessarily for everyone. But if it inspires you in a way to get involved in your own manner, like doing what you do best or what you, what you, uh, what you are the best at, for the coast, for the ocean, for this planet, then then it's awesome. And I think this is this is probably one of the best legacy of uh, of Paul Watson because he inspired people, and and the people who get involved in their turn inspire others. And basically, Sea Shepherd is a great example of what can be done, and some things that people think are impossible. That is a that is a wonderful story and it's a strong imagery and very evocative. Thank you very much. Um, and it is certainly a way that inspires people to fight for what matters to them. That yeah, lots of people who know that what's happening is wrong would see that and then perhaps find out more and engage more and call for for action and solutions more. And it's it's a very different approach um, to the approach that uh, Anne Marie is is working with with Artport and making waves. Um, there's, there's a lot of contrasts come to mind to me in in those different ways, and I love that there's so there's such a diversity of, of solutions to the climate emergency. There are so many different ways in which we can engage people, um, from inspiring to informative to scientific information to artistic to engagement to community. Another one of the the um, I, I read up a, a fair bit about climate anxiety recently, and because so much of what is happening in the world today is it's very overwhelming and our response to overwhelming information like that existential crisis is to put our head in the sands and and watch Netflix and do whatever else and get on with our, our, our small lives. Um, and not really engage too much. But the, the, the best way to deal with that kind of climate anxiety is to get together with other people, whether it's becoming more active in an organization like Sea Shepherd or coming together, um, like Anne-Marie talked about, young people who were so inspired <laughs> this week and who have inspired her also. Um, Karen, do you have some uh, way in which you find that the you, you work with a lot of young people who are in third level studying climate change? And you mentioned earlier that there are a number of artists who've come on your climate justice masters. How do you think that they have become so engaged with the issues? What do you think are the avenues for people to become more engaged? It's really diverse, actually. Um, we've got a number of students you know, that are coming in from countries that are, you know, if you forgive the pun, at the coal face of climate injustice, where, you know, there are a few with degrees in agriculture, a few from, you know, communities that are badly impacted by climate change, and they are really starting to see the justice side of it. They want to, you know, they understand that this is not just, you know, something that's happening. This is something that is being allowed to happen. And that's being caused by people elsewhere. And um, so we get that side of things. And one of the first things um, I do when I teach um, my water module is to invite people to talk about water where they are from. And you get this real diversity of, of experiences. And, and that's really powerful. And it sort of sets the scene for um, you know, a lot of interaction and a lot of kind of comparison uh, comparisons of experiences um, but we also get a lot of people who are activists and feel that they'd like to have that more academic understanding um, we get 
journalists who, again, want to be writing about climate change and they feel they want a little bit more academic background to support that and, you know, like you say, the artists as well. Um, so really quite a wide uh, variety. And then also at um, uh, Glasgow Caledonian University in our department, we have an undergraduate program in environmental management, um, which is um, has changed quite a lot, I would say. It started off, you know, very traditional, looking after waste energy and water within organizations, within buildings and, and sustainable transport. So lots of ways of improving the environment. But I think at that level as well, we are now starting to integrate the global angle and the justice angle more and more. So um, you also get students from the environment management um, undergraduate course that are thinking actually it's climate justice I really want to um, move into. So that's that's kind of another source of, of where the students are coming from. So it's it's a mixed um, it's a mixed bunch, and I think that's one of the strengths of the program. That's brilliant. It sounds like a microcosm of what we need um, in if we're going to solve the climate crisis is that um, diversity of perspectives of people coming from a background, whether they're journalist or an artist or a, a, a scientist who wants to upskill um, and also the multinational dimension. And that's this event is particularly wonderful because we have so many people in a number of different countries attending here and the, the, the climate crisis calls for us to have a, multi, a, a, a multinational approach in a way that we have never needed so much in the world. Um, Anne-Marie, I imagine that a lot of your work involves also um, people from all sorts of different countries and, and multinational projects. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that and the differences of perspectives that come in when you're working on a project? Um, yeah, this, maybe this... I can give an example because we launched the program uh, We Are Ocean two years ago. Um, it's in the meantime, it has be, been endorsed by UNESCO as a uh, UN Ocean Decade um, action. And we started in Berlin and Brandenburg around Berlin with um, many stakeholders in Germany, like uh, scientific institutions, research institutes, um, different sponsors as well, obviously uh, schools, uh, yeah, the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. So the interests were also different. One interest of one institution was more intellectual, the other one was more marine research. Then we have the school children or the school students who had like the specific uh, expectation or the schools had the specific expectation. Then we had the venues, the museums where we were showing events like performances. Then we moved, and that was really fantastic. Then we moved to Marseille and um, did the same there with marine research institutes and schools and uh, involved in the uh, Manifesta Biennial there and the IUCN World Congress this year. And well, I'm working in this international um, field since more than 20 years. So I'm know how to speak to different people, to speak to different, well, in, in different languages as well. So I have this certain intercultural understanding. I can adapt like a chameleon to the specific um, yeah, context somehow. That's a very special skill in itself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I wanted to, to quickly say something regarding the young people, how they address. I, for example, in Germany, I felt this um, climate anxiety very much. It, I was shocked by the statements of the kids of what they relate, um, how they relate to climate change, how they relate to the ocean, the state of the ocean. It was terrifying. Um, I will not go into detail here. I can, well, you can see the films which we produced. Um, then here in, in Glasgow, where well, that were like students or school students between 12 and 17 years, here we had university students. In Marseille, we had kids from six to eight, and they were incredibly smart. They were like creative. They wanted to learn more, and they were really 
like breathing in all the knowledge and also the creative material we gave them, creative material in the sense of um, intellectual material and what they created out of that and how active they became showed us that they want to become active. So action is really important, not only getting the knowledge on board, but really becoming part of this whole thing. And so with, with, with each project, you have to adapt to the situation. And this is, of course, for me, is one of the reasons why I chose to build up Artport and why I chose it to be international. I could have stayed in Germany. I'm German. I could have built it up in Germany, but I wanted to be um, international because young people, they are different. The institutions are different and you have to implement action everywhere. And um, But this is a personality, a question of personality, of course. Yes. And staying on that question of personality, um, can you tell me, Anne-Marie, a little bit about your aha moment that when you decided that this was what you um, felt was the, the best way that you can contribute to the climate crisis? Or, yeah. or, or was it that maybe it was some other avenue that you came to it? Uh, no, it was exactly that. You, you know, I was in the contemporary arts. I was an art advisor. I had my gallery. So I was, you know, traveling around with my clients around the planet. And it was like a very privileged uh, bubble in which I was living. But I was not happy with this bubble. I wanted to move out there. And since my whole life, like French people say, I was always ecolo. So I was always engaged with the environment somehow in my lifestyle, in my thinking, and I was always trying to teach my um, wealthy collectors to behave more sustainably. Complete failure. I should have not even tried that. Um, without judging it, it's just a different lifestyle and it's difficult to adapt this different lifestyle to a sustainable mindset. And um, I said, okay, 2004, it's enough. I cannot go on like this anymore. Um, and together with Corinne Ernie, the co-founder of Artport Making Waves, we sat down. She's Swiss, but based in New York, and she grew up in the Alps. I grew up on the North Sea. So we said, let's move the environmental question into the arts. And uh, that was the aha moment. And then I read the book, The In the Inconvenient Truth, which, of course, today, like um, 16, yeah, 16 years, 17 years later, it's much debated. We know that. But nevertheless, for me, it was a trigger. And I told that I met Al Gore some years ago in Bonn for the climate change conference. And I told him that he was actually the trigger for me to focus on climate change. I wanted to do something environmentally a little bit broader, but climate change was then for me the rooftop for everything because under climate change, you can unite a lot of environmental issues which we have and challenges which we have today. Excellent. Thank you for that. That, that, that. In particular, there, that's interesting that it was a book, that it was Al Gore's book, and that you were bringing your, your arts world as such to, to the table of action, of, 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 trans translating or transforming um, the arts world into a, a platform for activism to engage more people. Um, I want to jump now to the, the idea that which you touched on, there are so many different issues come together under climate change. So we have climate justice, um, we have biodiversity loss, we have water, access to water, um, we've mentioned salmon there and the loss of salmon, we have whales, um, which Lamia spoke about. I know that there's actually an amazing and very surprising link between whales and climate change they do impact the circulation of carbon in the ocean. Um, there are so many different issues that come under the umbrella of climate change. Um, and I want to ask Lamia to point out to our audience a little bit about why oceans are so important in climate change. I know that there are very many threats to ocean habitats. Um, number one is overfishing, and I know that climate change is not the primary threat to our ocean ecosystems, from what I've been researching. Um, but yet there are enormous links, in particularly in how the ocean absorbs so many of our greenhouse gases and buffers us against the worst impacts of climate change. Lamia, can you outline to us a little bit about that relationship between the ocean and climate change, please? Um, yeah, it's true that climate change is not the number one threat on the ocean, but definitely the death of the ocean and the diminishment of life in the ocean is the number one threat on climate change because uh, the ocean is the first producer 
the biggest producer of oxygen and is the first um, absorbent of uh, carbon dioxide. So it's the main lung of this planet, even before the forest, because it's the phytoplankton that produces most of the oxygen we breathe. <laughs> and the presence of whales is directly related to uh, the amount of phytoplankton that we have in the ocean. And the whale hunt has, uh, has had as a consequence to diminish uh, phytoplankton in the ocean up to 40%. So that there has been uh, studies and research uh, saying that um, one whale does more for uh, climate change than, than thousands of trees. So it's not about saying whales are more important than trees, but it's true that we always think of forests as the main land of the planet, and we underestimate the role of the ocean. And the hardest thing is that because what's happening in the ocean is out of sight and out of mind, it is quite hard to make people feel involved. And when people don't live by the coast, they feel that they have no impact or that they are not concerned. And if there is one thing that people need to understand is that if the ocean dies, there is no life for us on this planet. That's it. And because we have a very anthropocentric way of seeing the world, we call this planet planet Earth when it's actually planet or the ocean. And our challenge with sea shepherds is also to help people. Uh, we do we reveal that connection uh, between our own survival and the ocean. And this is about physical survival, like biological. Uh, physical and, and uh, chemical, but it's also um, about our souls, really. I mean, the French uh, author Baudelaire says, three men, you will always always cherish the sea. What is more inspiring uh, for the human soul than, than the ocean and like sunset or sunrise on the ocean? This is like universal beauty that shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, if we are not sensitive to that if we don't feel anything uh, when we are in, in that kind of landscape, then I think there is little hope for us as a species because it means that we are disconnected from nature. And all the, the decisions we are going to take uh, are going to be uh, uh, the wrong ones if we forget how important that is. And just to to, um, to comment on what you were saying uh, about the diversity of, uh, of profiles of people who get involved, I think even within the very specific uh, way of action of Sea Shepherd, what I really appreciated when I first joined is the multiplicity of personalities, backgrounds, nationalities of people who were all on board the same boat. Uh, to defend the ocean. I mean, we had people who had been working in uh, stock markets. We had tattoo artists, we had musicians, we had mechanics, we had, I mean, uh, teachers, lawyers, I mean, you name it. I mean, I mean, people from every possible background you can imagine that were on that ship to defend the ocean. And I thought that was really, really, inspiring. I mean, I remember we had like over 20 nationalities uh, on that campaign I mentioned before. And, and that's on average on, on the big vessels. That's what we have. So and people who come from all different reasons. And, and more widely, I really like the fact that there are so many approaches and ways of doing things because um, it's like it's like ecosystems, you know, like the movement to defend and protect this planet is stronger by the diversity of the means of the people who uh, to contribute. And the more the diversity, the, the stronger the movement is. And um, and I think it's it, it's great. And and uh, the best remedy against anxiety that you mentioned before. I believe definitely is to be involved and to be in, in action. Action is the best uh, remedy against depression and anxiety. Of course, if you feel that there is nothing you can do and you feel that everything is falling apart, then 
your survival mode will be to just shut down. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to see what's happening because you feel so helpless and powerless. And I mean, that will drive you mad. So the only option to uh, to face reality is to feel that you are, are actually empowered to do something about it. And and this is not going to be um, even an effort or a sacrifice. I, I remember when I was in Antarctica in, in Christmas, we were getting messages from people thanking us for our sacrifice. And I was like, I don't feel like I'm sacrificing anything. I feel blessed that I'm in a position where I can feel so useful. And, and this is like helping the planet, feeling that you can be part of the solution is so good for yourself as well. And I think it's it's the only thing that can allow us to survive without getting completely mad with the situation that we're in. And yes, uh, either through avoidance or or other ways, definitely. Um, I've done a lot of work with with youth groups in Ireland and also the same same is true, whether it's kind of an artistic representation or coming together to map out the cycle needs in their community or whatever kind of a project getting active. I so agree with you there, getting active with a group of people um, is the best antidote to climate anxiety. Um, and I was struck also, Anne-Marie mentioned that the climate anxiety among young people that she's been working with uh, in, in Germany. Um, is that, the, can, you, can you tell us more about the climate anxiety and young people and, and ways that we can work with that and try and help guide our young people to, to action? And we, don't, we, we definitely don't want to fob people off on, on on nonsense actions that aren't getting anywhere, and yet we, we <laughs> yeah, how, how do we do that? How do we help uh, them? Because they really are showing the way. And I mean, we know with, with so many of the young activists, they're the ones who are really putting the pressure on the decision maker and the politicians. And it, it's the thing that gives me hope more than anything else I've seen in the last five years is the, the force with which our young people are, are speaking up and calling for action. I think the most important thing is to listen. This is not only regarding young people, this is regarding everybody. And listening is a form of respect. And this is what is where we really have a huge lack. They are not listened, specifically not the young indigenous people. They are used as nice symbols. Look here, we have an indigenous person here. This is tokenism. Mm -hmm. but you have to listen. That's what we did as well. We were shocked at the first moment to hear that um, you know what, we are too many people on this planet Earth, why don't we kill each other? That's what teenagers in Berlin, 15 years old, said. We didn't know where that was coming from because we didn't speak about overpopulation. Um, and then they came up with ideas how we could reduce the population in the world. You know, crazy ideas. Um, influenced by social media, influenced by science fiction series and comics and things like that. So there is a lot of um, very dark ideas going on for the kids. Um, and you, first of all, you have to swallow that. And they were not in Berlin, they are not connected directly to the sea or to the ocean. Um, but they had a specific idea and then we listened to them and then we tried to turn it around to make something positive out of that. Um, to create something, to become active in something. Um, here we had it with the students at the Glasgow School of Art. We worked together with Into the Oceanic, uh, Elizabeth Ogilvie and Rob Page from Edinburgh, two filmmakers. They are having um, outdoor projections here tonight as well. And we brought a lot of scientists and uh, a seaweed forager who is actually from Aotearoa from New Zealand and he is a Maori. And he is living in Scotland in, in the area around Edinburgh since 10 years. And he is a seaweed forager, which means he's collecting seaweed. And he brought to us the seaweed. He brought really a big backpack of seaweed and explained it to us. And um, we saw how the young people were engaged with that. So you have to bring them something as well, not only speak about the facts, the facts are there, but also speak about possible solutions where they can come up and the possible solutions are not the big ones. They are always the small local community ones. So bring a group of young students from the university to the east of Scotland 
and let them dive and step into seaweed and feel it and eat it and collect it and do something with it and understand the um, importance of seaweed also as, um, as a carbon sink. And you know the, all these um, different interconnections and interdependencies. First, they understand, but then when they jump into the ocean, I always say, you know, when you are depressed, don't take antidepressants or go to a shrink. Go to the sea or the ocean, jump into it, and swim for half an hour. The colder, the better. When you get out, you are transformed. I mean, this is banal, I know, because uh, depression and climate half an hour <laughs> is, is much more serious. I know, but um, yeah listen and, and give them solutions and uh, space for creativity as well. Super. Um, that, and that, I think that applies to all of us listening and listening to each other. I was at a, a wonderful event the other day um, with the president of Ireland of, of a community, a Dublin inner city, Dublin community, um, where it was all about co-creating solutions. And it was taking existing social issues in that inner city area where there are a lot of social problems and um, listening to people as to what they need in their community, what it is they need most, uh, things like housing instability and uh, were, were, were some of the major issues um, and economic deprivation. Um, and they, by with this, this process of listening and coming at it with a climate action and a climate justice perspective, they've come up with a number of solutions that meet those problems through climate action. So a, a retrofitting home energy retrofitting club, um, a, a collective of cycle cyclists doing last mile delivery in that neighborhood. Some really wonderful co-created solutions coming from the community to tackle social issues through climate action. Um, I would love to see more of that happening worldwide. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really delighted that you brought up the, the one of the best things we can do um, is to listen. Um, I'm gonna jump. There's one we, we have about, uh, we, only, we have about seven minutes left on, on discussion time. And one thing that has been touched on, but we haven't really delved into, um, is, is gender. When we talk about the different voices being represented in the discussion, um, this in, in the film, um, Marché sur l'eau, um, one of the women at the beginning um, was trying to get the other saying, we should speak up. We can't leave the decision just to the men. We should speak up. We need a borehole. We're spending so much of our time every day not doing what we should be doing because we, we're having to walk 10 kilometers to the well, draw the water and walk back. Um, and they said, and women are the most affected. And this is the exact same words that we're hearing globally is that women are the most affected. But this was one very small community of women. Um, and they were saying it just in, in relation to them not having access to water, that the women are the most affected because the women are having to walk to the well. Um, Karen, I would like to bring you in on this with your expertise on, on climate justice. And I know that you um, have done some work or are doing some research work around gender and climate. Can you talk to us about, about women being the most affected? Why is that and, and what can we do about that? There are just so many different examples of that and I'm really glad you're, you're bringing this into the conversation. Um, globally, it's, it's nearly always the women that are responsible for it, um, getting water to the household. So um, as soon as there's you know, difficulties with that, like for example, if the, you know, the water resource that they have been used and if that dries up or it becomes, you know, too polluted or whatever, it means that the women have to walk further. Um, and that means they've got less time left for, you know, economically productive activities. And also it's often, you know, girls from quite a young age are involved in getting the water. So they miss out on school and really, you know, the drier it gets, the further they have to walk. It's as simple as that. Um, so that's, um, that's maybe the most kind of direct impact, but there are other impacts as well. Like in, um, as you say, women are often underrepresented in decision-making processes. Um, and that means that despite the fact that it's the women that have to work with the water, it's the men that are taking the decisions about the water and that does not always result in decisions that suit the women's needs. Um, there's, um, there's other issues as well, like as um, women 
are having to make these longer journeys, um, they're exposed to quite a lot of danger. Now that can be from, you know, male violence along the way, it can be sexual harassment, sexual attacks, um, but also from, you know, wild animals. It's these journeys are not uh, to be sniffed at. They're, they're, they're dangerous journeys. Um, and then when they get there, um, they're in contact with the water, which is um, still, you know, in its raw state. So even though there might be treated, treatment later on, they might have water filters later on, um, quite often the women are exposed to, you know, quite polluted water sources. So there's health impacts there as well. And the physical act of carrying the water is also, um, you know, quite bad for um, your, your body, especially when you've got, you know, young girls carrying these, these heavy weights. Um, and then when the woman, you know, gets home and she has maybe not been able to get enough water or there's, you know, she's not able to fulfill her domestic responsibilities with regard to water, then she may be subject to domestic violence as well. So there really just are so many different ways um, in which the women are uh, more affected. And at the same time, they often have less access to like not just the decision making, um, but also, for example, less access to finance. So if there is a need for investment in water infrastructure, the women are not as able to do that as readily because they haven't got any money. Um, or they're, they're not able to take out loans and, and things like that. Um, and like, the, like the men can. Okay. Uh, so gender gender equality is is extremely um, tightly related with with climate justice and climate action participation and decision making and that should be equal. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. and there's an intergenerational um, issue as well where um, age um, has you know relevance to vulnerability. So both the very old and very young tend to be the most vulnerable like we're, we hear in these stories that you know children are missing out of course children are going to be exposed to the worst of the climate impacts um but also you know where there had been progress and there has been fantastic progress in terms of you know safety of water globally it you know it's going in the right direction but climate change has you know poses the risk to to disrupt that process and and put you know the children at risk again which is tragic yeah yeah i see Anne marie uh, wants to contribute something here yes uh, just a, a brief uh, comment because we were in 2009 um, commissioned by uh, several un organizations one among them was the global gender and climate alliance which was at that time in 2009 just newly created it was a network of several un organizations where women wanted to really put onto the agenda of the un um, the, the gender issue and we were commissioned with an exhibition about gender and climate change specifically women and climate change um, for COP15 in Copenhagen and it was really interesting to see the lack of knowledge about the topic of women and climate change among civil society they asked us about what do women have to do with climate change they thought that we would only commission women artists and they said but you also have male artists here in this uh, exhibition or in this project and we had to explain to them that it is you know the artist can be whatever gender uh, but it's about the topic and the um they didn't have that on their agenda neither women issues were not on the agenda of climate change conferences in 2009. This is why the network was created. And I think in these last 12 years, I mean, Karen knows that better than I do, but um, maybe some things have changed, but at the end, not very much. When you go, we worked with uh, several um, artists who were working on, an, of, on African issues regarding women and uh, fetching water like Herring described right now. And I think in, in African countries, not a lot has changed since then. No, yeah. um, and and even, um, even in COP, I mean, I, I wasn't there, but the photos that I see of decisions that are being announced or policies that are being announced, they are still at least two thirds male, older white males announcing these big decisions. And uh, Mary Robinson, who I'm sure everybody knows, our, our four, there's my um, 
timer. Um, our former president of Ireland, claim her, um, and now one of the, the, the chair of the elders, she was quite critical that the, where there was a lack of, of diversity, specifically in, in people from different parts of the world um, not being represented equally at COP. So that is a, is a massive issue, as well as women. Um, I want to just remind our, our participants and our audience that we, we have got now a, a slot for questions. Um, if you want to put questions in the Q&A box, please feel free to, to have questions for uh, any of our three panelists or for myself. Um, in the meantime, I would like to, to jump back to something that was mentioned earlier with Lamia. Um, and I didn't jump in, I didn't want to interrupt her at the time, but she talked about the role of whales um, in the ocean in climate change. Um, and I think it's something that a lot of people might not be aware of and they might be wondering, have they misheard? Did they hear that wrong? <laughs> what have whales got to do with climate change is to do with their, their feces effectively creating a lot of growth of, of plankton, isn't that right? And then that plankton gets sucked down into the, the floor of the ocean and locked away long term. Is that what you were referring to, Lamia? Yeah, basically the, the feces of whales are like the fertilizer of Phytoplankton, and um, and because whales produce so much species, uh, they they waste a lot on the uh, yeah they are like the gardeners of the sea, and it, it's not only whales actually there are some key species keystone species in the ocean, and whales are among them, but sharks as well. Uh, sh sharks and uh, the problem with sharks is that they don't uh, benefit from the same charismatic image uh, as whales. Um, but sharks are the, uh, the champions of evolution. They are uh, 450 million years old, uh, and basically, all, the whole life in the ocean has evolved around the presence of sharks. And they are being wiped out in a catastrophic uh, speed. Uh, they uh, they made it through all the basically they are more ancient than dinosaurs. They survived the last uh, massive extinction crisis, and humankind is driving them to extinction in like one blink of an eye. And uh, yeah, sharks, whales, all the top predators uh, on top of the food chain in the ocean uh, play a very specific role. But it, actually, if you enlarge that, because everything is so connected in the ocean and there is a strong interdependence of the uh, species. That's the reason why we, we say at Sea Shepherd that fish, for example, um, are like the workers of that climate change, uh, of that climate machinery uh, that is the ocean. And the overconsumption of fish today is the number one threat on the ocean. But so overfishing is the number one threat mm -hmm. on the ocean. And, and what we say is that fish actually has more value in the ocean, playing its role in that amazingly complicated and, and sophisticated and fragile uh, food chain and balance than in the plates of many of us. I mean, obviously, there are some people who depend on fish for survival, and this is not an issue. There is enough fish in the ocean for people depends on fish for survival. The problem is that the vast majority of people who could easily have alternatives and who eat fish without even thinking about it, like the sushi mania, like people eating fish, like, like if they would be eating carrots really long without making any difference. The Sea Shepherd has been very much involved in the past few years in Africa, trying to defend African waters for uh, also for the local fishermen and local population who actually depends on fish for survival. And most of this fish is actually being taken away and ending up on the European markets because European people eat much more fish than what European waters can provide. So this is all very connected. It's just that whales and dolphins uh, are um, charismatic species that allow us to uh, get crap people attention on what's happening. And basically what we say is that if we don't manage to save whales with the huge sympathy that people feel for whales, then we won't save anything in the ocean. So when people say, okay, but if whales disappear, then so what? Like, 
I don't think we will live in a world without whales, because if there are no whales, it means we didn't save the ocean. And if we don't save the ocean, we don't save ourselves. So we are directly connected to the whales this um, there, there, I think there are a number of questions coming in. Um, so, uh, but one is also for you, Lamia, about the ocean. So I'm going to direct that to you. But I'm also conscious we have we have only 15 minutes um, left. But there is one person, Sophie Caranta, is asking um, Lamia if you can please expand a bit more on the importance of oceans in relation to climate change and the melting of the ice caps in particular with the changes we know are happening presently with El Nino and the Gulf Stream, which are affecting global, uh, global climate? Well, as I said before, the, the ocean is the number one provider of oxygen through phytoplankton, uh, much more than forests. And it's also the phytoplankton that uh, gets most of the carbon dioxide that's, um, and, and green effect gases that we uh, put in the, in the atmosphere. So if it wasn't for the ocean, uh, the climate would already be unbearable. So basically we are buying time with the ocean, but the most of the ocean gets all these green effect gases and the more uh, it gets sick itself. And the, the warming of waters is also disturbing the balance of the ocean. But again, uh, climate change is an issue for the ocean but the diminishment of the ocean uh, is, is a much bigger issue for climate change. So, and that's the reason why um, basically changing uh, your food habits uh, is, uh, is absolutely fundamental because on a planet with 7 billion people, we have to adapt. Basically, we cannot behave like if we were a um, few minutes. So 7 billion people who eat um, uh, fish and meat is just not doable on, on this planet. Mm -hmm. so, and I even know again in, in, in Ireland, but I think it's it's the same worldwide is that we, we have massive issues even with trawling and the fact that there's so much blue carbon. We have kelp forests, we have seagrass, we have many of our ocean habitats store a huge amount of carbon and when we trawl over those, we destroy them and that carbon is released so existing carbon stores in the ocean are being impacted by by some fishing methods and, and as you as you say we're so everything in the ocean is interdependent and interrelated and that also relates to everything on land every second breath we breathe comes from the ocean comes from the plankton in the ocean um, and it's something that we, we tend to be so dissociated from um the diminishment of marine life in the ocean basically. there's what the diminishment of marine life yeah uh is the number one threat yeah, so healthy oceans buffer us. Our healthy oceans are our ally against climate change, and we need to we need to get our heads around this the same way that forests are. I know I know to a greater extent, but so many um, natural habitats, terrestrial and marine, are our greatest allies in the face of climate change, and we really need to turn our attention more towards that that. Um, all that we get from healthy functioning ecosystems, marine and terrestrial. Um, Agnes Callahan has a has a question. Agnes, um, I don't know if you can hear me. Are you able to, to ask us that question? Um, can we unmute Agnes Callahan there? Agnes, do you want to ask uh, your question? Well, I didn't really have one, I've, uh, but um, I think we are all connected. It's like a web. You know, everything is connected. Uh, That's right. It's like a web. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very yeah. much, Agnes. And and yeah. Lamia, Lamia has been has been um, illustrating that for us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The whale and uh, yeah, it's a bit frightening the the rapidity at which the um, ice caps are melting. And the webs of life are unraveling as well, especially yeah. when we take out the top predators, as Lamia indicated there with, with sharks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Agnes. There's, a, there's another question from John Bird, um, who's saying that the lack of planning control of urban runoff from paving over domestic gardens, um, the Knockline Network of Sustainable Energy Community, 
flood management that that is another one i don't know if anybody of the other panelists want to jump in but in terms of um adapting to the impacts of climate change we are going to be seeing a lot more flooding right across the world we're going to see more intense bouts of of precipitation um and one of the ways back to what i was saying before in which we can make ourselves our communities more more resilient to the impacts of flooding is through natural flood management so that this is i think the the issue that um John Bird is alluding to there we need to work with nature and work with natural systems whether it's wetlands woodlands um, soils that are able to absorb water rather than compacted overexploited soils where the, the water runs over land as opposed to penetrates the soil. There are so many ways in which natural healthy ecosystems are going to buffer us, are buffering us um, against the worst impacts of climate change. And the way in which this happens is so different in different parts of the world. Um, but this is something that I haven't seen much of. I mean, I haven't, maybe I haven't been following closely enough, but I haven't seen this realization dawning um, from what I've seen coming from the COP26. Do, do any of the panelists know if this is being discussed um, using, using healthy natural ecosystems as, a, as our ally um, in adapting to the worst impacts of climate change? No. <laughs> It's not something that's been that's been raised enough in the same way as Lamia is talking about the, the oceans are, are she, I think you commented that it's not until this COP that, that the role of the oceans is really being featured. Yeah, I think there is um, there is interest in nature based solutions and, and in kind of, you know, increasing um, the amount of green space in cities and the amount of blue space in cities as well, which has got just so many benefits, you know, for health and well-being. And again, the, the mental health in particular, and I think everyone realized that in particular during lockdown as well, how, how much difference that makes. So, um, and at the same time, of course, the, those green spaces really help with the runoff issue because they do let the water penetrate so there's less runoff but um yeah what what john says is that you know people still pave over their domestic gardens and that's absolutely true but i think there's an awareness issue there too and um it's maybe not something that's been communicated all that much so the people that do flood communication you know they tell people right you're at risk of you know, a 1% risk of being flooded every year. You know, that's the terminology that's, that is being used in flood communications. And I think, and this is also based um, on a research project that we're involved in for the Scottish government. And um, that there's just such, well, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, sorry. Um, there's just such a wealth of different messages about flooding that kind of need to get out there. and don't pave over your garden is one of those messages, but that's not one that's had all that much attention so far. Um, so, yeah. And it's so basic. There are so many really basic <laughs> messages that aren't getting out there in terms of um, ad adapting to climate change. Um, I, would, I would like just to, because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a marine scientist, and I'm not an urban planner, I can only speak on behalf of the experience that I have in, I had in the arts. And um, we did a project in 2010 as part of the climate change conference in Cancun, and then we moved it over to Miami, where we were uh, speaking about, it was a project called La Isla Hundida, the sunken island by a Spanish artist. And we were talking with young people in both in Cancun and in Miami in several schools about uh, the risk of rising sea levels. And in Miami, um, you know that uh, the city is actually built not really below the water, but very, very close. So every time there is rainfall or the, the sea level is rising just a little bit, the water is not only flooding the beaches, but the water is coming through the sewage system up and flooding the streets. And they had the, the issue already 10, 11 years ago when we worked there and we worked with the kids and they had amazing ideas and we were trying to push um, the local community leaders as well, but they didn't um, see this topic as really urgent. And now 10 years later, you know how many times Miami is flooded in, in, the, in the winter season when it's raining a lot and when the tides are rising. And now finally that they are really heavily affected, 
the community leaders are moving. So what I want to say with that, in the arts, um, there is a lot of visionary thinking. So we speak about issues which are not yet on the table of the policymakers, national, international, local, etc. But they don't want to listen because they say, oh, this is only the arts and yeah, some scientists until they are really affected by something. And this is really human stupidity. Only something happens until, you know, like the police, oh, we cannot look for this person, which is obviously has disappeared until the person is dead, you know like just like a metaphor for that. So um, this inaction until something really terrible happens is um, terrifying. And we want the civil society to push there more. And this is why we are working with the arts and uh, well, to clarify some issues before they happen, before they affect us too much. I, I really, I, what you're saying is that we as humans are so resistant to change. We, we, we will not change if we can if we think we can possibly get away with not changing and I think that that has not dawned on the majority of people that we we need to change especially the majority of people who who live a comfortable privileged life who are in the countries who are the most responsible for climate change and then there, there was an example from from this film Marche sur l'eau um, at the beginning, one of the women in the in the school, they're they're learning to say the words climate change in the classroom, and it's a really sweet scene. Uh, and they're saying, "What is climate change?" And and it was, somebody explains to them that it's the rich people um, who are pumping gases into the atmosphere, and that is making climate change. And it's a problem mainly for us, even though we didn't cause it. And they say, actually say it even more simply than that. Um, they understand and have much less power to act than we do. We have more access to those um, participative ways in which we can, we can do something about it. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing a greater engagement from the arts world in framing our values and realizing that there is such urgency to ch fundamental changes to every level of how we live uh, how we eat, how we travel, um, our politicians. I'm, I'm really hoping that there will be, that this COP26 is raising it to such a level that people, no matter what walk of life they're in, will, will come together and, and insist on that, that adjustment. Um, I think all of us have a responsibility to speak up. And when I say all of us, I mean, everybody who's attending, all of our participants, as well as all of our, our panelists. Have a, have a massive responsibility to speak up about the urgency of the challenges that we face. Um, one more thing that I, I am particularly interested in is psychology and how there, there, I think there is more research now, we don't have a psychologist among us, but um, looking at the process of change and how we, we humans um, can change our thinking and change our, our perspective on things. Um, are there any closing comments from any of the panelists before I, I say good night to everybody and say thank you to everybody? No. Yes, Anne Marie. Yeah, I would like to say because we are we were invited by the Goethe Institute, Alliance Francaise, and, and Institut Francais, and uh, Institut Ecos, if I'm right. And these are all organizations who are bringing together art and what, culture and education. And uh, the Goethe Institute is very much engaged with science at this intersection as well. And I think we really have to support those organizations more. We have to go more to the events. We have to interact more with the Goethe Institute. And I'm saying that to myself as well, because where I live, I have a Goethe Institute as well. Um, but really to support those organizations because they are important to bringing these topics which we are talking about right now to civil society. And this can create also interaction. And um, because culture is not happening at home and it's not only happening in museums, it's also happening with interaction and participation. And that's important to create a real change and to become active. Perfect, thank you very much, Anne-Marie. That's um, excellent closing words. Uh, I'd like to say a, a, a particular thank you to each of our panelists, Dr. Karen Helvig, uh, Anne-Marie Melster, and Lamia S.M. Lally.
thank you so much for your contributions. Um, I also want to thank in particular the, the Goethe Institute, um, the Alliance Francaise, um, the Goethe Institute in Dublin and in Glasgow, I should say, and the Alliance Francaise in Dublin and in Glasgow, the Institute Francaise, and the Climate Crisis Film Festival, um, who've all been involved in organizing tonight's event. Um, and I hope that everybody knows that you can watch the, the film Above Water online from now, from 8 p.m., and it's exactly 8 p.m., until Saturday the 13th of November on the Goethe Institute platform. And there's a link has been provided there in the comments section. And I watched the film with my, my household last night and everybody absolutely loved it diverse perspective of people in my household um, who all vouch for it. It was wonderful. So thank you very much to everybody. That was a, a really insightful event. Thank you. Okay. I am, thank you. I shall close the meeting. Good night, everybody. Enjoy the film. Good night. Thank you. Good night.